Good morning, everyone. Today is Shushan Purim. Shushan Purim is the day that the Jews in the capital of Shushan celebrated their victory, which took an extra day to win the war. And therefore, the law is that all cities that are walled cities, like the city of Shushan, celebrate Purim today. Which means that in the old city of Jerusalem, today is the celebration of Purim. Uh, unlike we also celebrated yesterday, they did not celebrate yesterday. Today is their Purim. But for us, it's still a minor holiday, Shushan Purim. And the miracle of our generation is that we're actually back in the old city of Jerusalem, in the old walled city, and we're able to have a Shushan Purim in Jews celebrating in the old walled city of Jerusalem, uh, something that didn't take place for almost 2,000 years till 1967. As a, as a, as a Jewish community under the, uh, our, own, uh, our own governance. And, you know, when you think about the miracle of the 67 war, it remi- it's similar to the miracle of Purim. Our enemies were bent on destroying us and, and we were victorious. It reminds me of the story that they say that after the war, the world was very impressed by Moshe Dayan, who won the war in six days. So America sent a communication. In those days, Israel was starting out. They were struggling financially in the early years. Today, Israel is the startup nation. But those days, it was very difficult. They sent a message to Israel. They said, we'll trade you any two of our generals for General Moshe Dayan. Which two generals do you want? And Israel sent back a message We'll take General Electric and General Motors. <laughs> so today, thank God, we're strong economically and militarily. Um, but there's an interesting discussion in the Talmud. The Talmud says, where do we find all the actors in the story of Purim? Esther, Mordechai, Haman, where do we find them in the Torah? Now, obviously, the Megillah and the story of Purim happened 2,300 years ago, a thousand years after the Torah was completed by Hashem and Moshe in the desert. However, everything is alluded to in the Torah. So the rabbi said, where do you find an, uh, an allusion to them in the Torah? And the, Torah, the Talmud answers every one. But when it comes to Haman, the Torah says, where do you find Haman's name in the Torah? And guess where we find it? When you go to the story of Adam and Eve, who ate from the tree of knowledge, God comes to Adam, he's hiding in the garden, and he says, did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? And of course, we know what happens. But when God asks the question of Adam, did you eat from the tree? God says, Hamin ha'etz. From the tree that I told you not to eat from, did you eat? And the word Hamin, did you eat from the tree, is spelled just like the word Haman. He, mem, nun. Hamin. Haman. So the rabbi said, ah, you see, we found Haman's name in the Torah. Now, is this some kind of a game? We found the letters He, mem, nun. What's the connection between Haman, who wanted to destroy the Jews? And Adam eating from the tree of knowledge and God confronting him and saying, did you eat from the tree? And our rabbis say there's a very deep connection. What's the deep connection? The deep connection is when you read the story of Purim, as, uh, Megillah, as we read yesterday, Haman was on top of the world. He was second in command. He was very powerful, very wealthy, very successful. Not only that, everyone had to bow down to him. That's how important he was. But what, got, what bothered him, what gave him no rest, no sleep at night? Every time he passed Mordechai the Jew, who would not bow to him, this is what irritated him, this is what got him angry. And so he comes home to his wife and he says, you know, every time I see this Jew Mordechai, you know, how dare he not bow down to me? What am I going to do with him? And that's when his wife says, ah, what you need to do is build a gallow 50 almost high and, and go to the king and have, have him hang. And he says, you're right, and I want to wipe out all the Jews who are part of the nation of Mordechai. So what was it that destroyed, what brought his own self to destruction? Here's a man who had everything in the world, but the, the, the envy or the anger or the lack of acceptance of the fact that he can't have it all, that this one Jew won't bow down to him, that's what bothered him. And that what made him bent on the destruction of the Jews, which ultimately led to his destruction, because when he comes to the king and he says to the king, I have a gallow. The king says, oh, who do I want to honor? Mordechai. And he, gets to, he has to parade him around the city. And one thing leads to another. And Esther goes and tells the king he wants to destroy me. And he gets hanged together with his ten sons. And the lesson is so... And that's exactly the story of Adam. Adam was put in the garden. He had every tree imaginable, every fruit. But God said, there's one tree you can't have. And what was he bent on getting? That one tree that he couldn't have. And what did that lead to? His being banished from the Garden of Eden. 
And the message for all of us is the same idea, that sometimes we have our own paradise, we have our own garden of Eden, we have so many blessings in our life. But human nature is we want the one thing we can't have. As they say, the grass is always greener on the other side. Or today in Shushan Purim, the grass is always green on the other side of the wall. You know, we look at who, what the next guy has. And instead of enjoying and appreciating what we have, we're so consumed with getting what we can't have in life, what we don't have, what someone else has, that it robs us of our own enjoyment and pleasure of what we do have, and it ultimately leads to our own downfall. And so the message of Haman and the message of the Garden of Eden is, you have what you have, enjoy what God gave you, count your own blessings, don't count someone else's blessings. And uh, I remember when I was, uh, you know, yesterday on Purim, the law is, whoever stretches out their hand, you must give them charity on Purim. Now, in, the, in Jewish communities, poor people go around and collect a lot of money on Purim. And there's a mitzvah to give charity to the poor. But you know, when I grew up in Brooklyn, there's something different than our shul here. And that is that, you know, when you go to the Kotel, people come up to you for tzedakah. Well, this goes on in all the shuls of Brooklyn, maybe also in other parts of the world. But when, you know, here we go around with the pushka. In Brooklyn, you don't have to go around with the pushka because as you're daven, a dozen people come over to you through, people just come through the shuls and go around to every person for tzedakah, collecting. And you always have coins or bills, whatever you want to give out, and you just keep on giving people charity. So when I daven in 770 every day, there are thousands of people pray every day, constant minions. And there's always dozens of beggars who come around, and you get to know them because they're there every single morning. They live in the community. They come to the community from all over. So there was this one character, his name was Teddy. He was a Russian Jew. He must have given himself an American name, Teddy. He's a little short old man. He was a very sweet man. He would come with this very kind, fine look on his face. Very thank you profusely when you gave him a coin. And he would collect every day. So one day someone saw Teddy in the local uh, grocery store uh, buying a lottery ticket. From the coins that he collected, he was buying a lottery ticket. So someone said to him, Teddy, what are you going to do if you win the lottery? He says, if I win the lottery, I'm going to put guards at every door of 770 to make sure that no other beggars come in so I can collect all the money myself. And it's a great metaphor because sometimes here he's dreaming of winning the lottery, but instead of thinking like a rich man, he's still thinking like a beggar. He's going to keep out all the other beggars. And it's true for every one of us. Sometimes instead of realizing that we're rich, in whatever way we're rich, we think like beggars. And we're always thinking about, what does someone else have that I don't have? And that's the way Haman thought. What is the one thing I can't have? And by obsessing on the one thing he couldn't have, like Adam in the Garden of Eden, that led to his downfall, to his destruction, and being banished in the case of Adam in the Garden of Eden. So Purim teaches us the secret to happiness, which is the happiest day of the year. To be happy, look at what God gave you, celebrate your life, celebrate your blessings, appreciate what you have, learn to love what you have in life, rather than looking over the wall on Shushan Purim and seeing what someone else in the next garden has.